Good day to everybody. It is May 18th. We are looking at 2 Chronicles chapters 28 through 31. And we begin in chapter 8 with the reign of King Ahaz, who we ran into back way back in 2 Kings. So uh, the chronicler uh, portrays Ahaz quite negatively. 2 Kings does as well. But um, Kings softens it a little bit. Well, the chronicler uh, really doesn't have much use for Ahaz uh, and emphasizes Ahaz's distant, distance from God. Now, the most important event we see during, uh, during uh, Ahaz's life uh, was uh, uh, what we get here in, uh, in this brief account not there's not too much about he did abominable practices we don't get too much here um anyway uh the big issue is the war that uh uh he's engaged in uh what's called the syrio ephraimite war syria and ephraim um and the the results of the war just solidifies the proof that Ahaz is unfaithful um, and Chronicles wants to emphasize uh, that unfaithfulness. Um, the, uh, the booty and the captives uh, are taken away from the sacred city. The captives are taken by the Northern Kingdom. Uh, they will return because of the intervention of the prophet Oded who warns uh, the uh, victors to be very careful about this because their sins are already great and to continue and to take this away uh, from Jerusalem would be a big mistake. Um, the prophet, prophet Oded in his speech points out that despite the constant strife that's happened between the, the Northern and Southern kingdoms, he wants to remind them um, that they are still one people and they are, they're still the people of God However, the chronicler clearly uh, thinks that Israel is uh, a lot less faithful to the covenant than the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, so uh, God has shown his displeasure to Judah and Israel because of their unfaithfulness. Um, but the northern kingdom gets special uh, denunciation for its repeated unfaithfulness, whereas Judah does have kings that do right in the sight of the Lord. Um, Israel uh, has kings that uh, one after another continue to disobey the Lord, disobey the covenant, worship false gods. All right. So the, the results of the Syrio after my war was that uh, Judah is vulnerable. So uh, the, F F the Edomites and the Philistines uh, are there to take advantage of that. Uh, that vulnerability, and um, Ahaz, uh, instead of asking uh, for the Lord's help, um, and he goes against Isaiah's advice, what he does is instead he asks the king of Assyria for help. Not a good thing. Assyria at this time is the rising geopolitical power in this part of the world. Uh, and Assyria does help, but it comes at a very heavy price. Assyria becomes, or uh, the Northern Kingdom becomes uh, a vassal of, of, of Assyria. They become a client state, if you will, and really uh, no longer have uh, uh, the autonomy they once did. Um, the Temple of God is, is shut down. And uh, unfortunately, the worship of Baals ensues. Now, it's possible that uh, Ahaz um, even used uh, the temple to worship pagan deities. I think I just said Ahaz in the Northern Kingdom. I mean, Ahaz in the Southern Kingdom, that, that, Assyria, that the Northern Kingdom too is gonna have its problems with Assyria and will be eventually uh, be taken into exile. But Judah survives, but it's kind of a client state. It's kind of a, a vassal, a puppet state of the uh, empire of Assyria. And according to the chronicler, because uh, Ahaz has been disobedient. Um, now, um, we also then get 
uh, an account of Ahaz's death, his burial is noticed again outside the royal burial grounds. He is not buried uh, with the other kings of, of Israel, but in this case, the southern kingdom, Judah, including David and Solomon. Um, it, it, uh, it, it, in some ways, uh, this, uh, this serves as a punishment for the unfaithful kings to not be buried with the other kings. Um, and and so, so it serves as a punishment for uh, their, their uh, misdeeds, their misbehavior, and their idolatry. Okay, so Ahaz is gone. His son Hezekiah ascends to the throne. And what we see here is Hezekiah, unlike his father, does what is right in the sight of the Lord. And he begins the process and it goes into great detail of purifying the temple and getting the temple uh, ready. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the chronicler here gives us added detail that Second Kings does not. So Hezekiah gives this uh, speech in the first part of chapter 29. And um, what we see here again is a revelation of the chronicler's uh, theology, uh, and it basically uh, can be summarized as the sins of the people have brought down the ire, the anger of God upon the people, but reconciliation is still possible. It's always possible. God is ready to forgive if the people return. And so Hezekiah becomes the divine agent, the divine representative of that reconciliation. Um, and so you get a lot of sacrifices for the rededication of the temple. What's important to note here is that um, the instructions for sacrifice, how the sacrifices are carried out, do conform to the law of Moses, do conform to how the sacrifices are offered. We see this in Leviticus 6. We see it in Numbers 18. So again, here you have, uh, through Hezekiah's leadership, the temple uh, being rededicated and purified and rededicated, and that the priests and Levites are carrying out their duties according to the instructions of the law. Now you get uh, a Passover celebration. So when you read Exodus 12, um, you, you get the impression that Passover is a private celebration in that it is supposed to be celebrated in the homes of, of families. So families celebrate the Passover, that's, and that's what happens today. Uh, in Judaism, Passover is celebrated in homes. Uh, but here it is a public festival. And part of the reason for that is that the Passover hasn't been celebrated in a long, long time. Uh, remember, uh, we've talked about this before, but in order for these kinds of things to continue in this culture where you, the average person is going to learn and remember things by what they're told because they don't have reading material, they don't have the copies of the Torah in their house, you depend upon the priests and the Levites to teach this, to keep it before the people. Well, if they don't, if you have kings uh, worshiping false gods and you have priests and Levites also doing the same thing and you don't continue to pass along the traditions and the instructions, it doesn't take uh, too long, uh, not even a generation actually, for people to forget and neglect these celebrations. So Passover hasn't happened in a long time. So Passover, is here used by King Hezekiah is a feast to bring to a celebration to bring together all of Israel, including those in the northern kingdom. And so letters are sent out to everybody to come to uh, Passover to uh, to come to the temple to celebrate Passover, and um, it, it's really not so much as an invitation to celebrate the Passover meal as to come return to the Lord at the temple on Mount Zion. Um, you do get um, some refugees from the Northern Kingdom who return. They are impure. In other words, they haven't purified themselves for celebration of Passover according to law. They probably don't know how to do that. Um, and we get an interesting, an interesting thing here. Um, um, Hezekiah 
uh, offers a prayer to God, asking God to pardon these who have come to celebrate. And basically saying, you know, they don't have all this straight. Um, they, they're not doing what they should have done according to the law. Uh, they probably don't know it. Um, but Hezekiah is saying, you know what, their heart's in the right place. So God, please pardon them. Uh, so, so here we have a, an overt example of how the internal disposition of a human being is important, even though the internal and the external are not matching up. So Hezekiah offers this prayer for God to pardon because these people have come to worship. They've come to return to you, God. And it's been a long time. And so there's no doubt they don't have everything right. I, I, I find that I find this to be this to be just um, a wonderful, touching moment. Uh, and you can almost imagine it being portrayed dramatically on the big screen um, of these persons who just don't know what to do, but they're coming to do uh, what they can anyway, because they want to return to the Lord. And uh, I, I mean, I just think it's a great, it's a great moment uh, here in Second Chronicles. So uh, where the heart matters too, actions matter and getting things right and how we do things right, it, it's important. But boy, you know, the heart, we all know, we've said, we've said at times, and it's also been true of us that maybe we something doesn't come out the way it should, but we say, you know, her heart was in the right place, her head was, her, his heart was in the right place. I think that's what's going on here. And I just really, I really like that. So you get continued on in uh, uh, chapter 31 with more religious reforms, purification of the temple, celebration of the Passover. Uh, Hezekiah reorganizes the Levites and the priests to serve in the temple. Uh, he clearly has good administrative skills. Um, so that the temple now can get down to full-time business. And we're told that King Hezekiah is able to do this. Why? Because he sought God with all his heart. That's the key, because he is seeking God with all of his heart. We get to a place now with Hezekiah where the temple hasn't functioned in this kind of uh, fullness of capacity since the reign of Solomon. So it's been a long time. So that's really that's really good news. And and Hezekiah, uh, he he doesn't he doesn't fulfill the Solomonic ideal, but he gets close. Uh, he he's a he's a uh, for the chronicler. He's he gets close for the chronicler. He is someone to be remembered, um, and and watched. All right. So a couple things just uh, by way of uh, uh, looking just a couple specifics from the big picture. We notice at the beginning of chapter 28, King uh, Ahaz, uh, he definitely uh, is not um, obedient. He does not do what is right in the, side, side, uh, in the sight of the Lord. Um, and verse two says, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. So for the chronicler, this is not a compliment. If, if you say of a king of Judah, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, this is not good. He walks in the ways of the of the king of King Ahab, okay, um, but he noticed the, the detail of his sin. Um, he made cast images for the Baals, and he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and made his sons pass through fire. He engaged in child sacrifice. The valley of the son of Hinnom, the valley of Hinnom, as it will be known in Jesus' day, is right south of Jerusalem. And it is traditionally the place where uh, God Moloch was worshipped and child sacrifice was offered, uh, that even Solomon uh, offered some of his children as sacrifices to the Lord. So uh, when, when you get this, when you get the Old Testament writers highlighting the issue of child sacrifice, this is as low as any king can go uh, when it comes to immorality, when it comes to rejection of God and the covenant and the rejection uh, of, of the law, because child sacrifice, which is so common in the ancient world, is forbidden in ancient Israel. So this is as low as you can get. Um, 
Also remember that, you know, when, when we continue to read about Aram, that is Syria, not us Syria, that is Syria, which uh, is basically geographically, you know, not pretty, uh, there's, there's variation in the boundaries, but it's pretty close uh, to the kingdom of Syria, the nation of, of Syria today. All right, so um, I think that's the last thing that I want to say. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty, I think I'm ready to close it out. So anyway, so tomorrow, uh, we've only got two more days in Second Chronicles before we get to Ezra. So tomorrow we will look at chapters 32, 33, and 34. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you again for the gift a beautiful day. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts in this day be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, friends. Hasta mañana.